Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of the world's biggest stars and some of my favourite people and a man who has had more hits than you can shake a stick at. One of his songs has over 8 million hits on YouTube. This man's got a brand new album out and he's coming to the UK to tour in September. He's going to be across the whole UK and his brand new album called Restless Years is terrific and he joins me live from down under on the phone now. Leo Sayer, how are you? How are you doing? Hey, mate, great to talk to you. Tell me about your life. There you are down under in this magical place. Of course, it's winter at the moment. Um, yeah, completely opposite seasons. Uh, I decided to move out. Of, I used to live in Sydney, and I've just moved out of Sydney. And uh, me and my partner, Donatella, and we've moved to the country where we live in a kind of idyllic sort of English village, it looks like. Um, it's where all the tourists come through on the way to driving to Canberra. And at the moment, they're driving on the way to the snow. So it's a complete contrast. But it's very lovely and peaceful. And I'm building a studio at the moment next door. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a lovely move for the future. We should really start 43 years ago when you had your first album. But let me just ask you about now. Why did you decide to move down there? Is it the weather? Is it the beauty? Or were you just fed up with England? Um, well, it was initially the work. I couldn't turn down the amount of work I was being offered here. And so it was becoming... You know, it always gets to that really point where somebody's got to pay the airfare and, um, you know, to get me all the way down there. And I don't really, getting to my older age, I don't really like travelling coach. So um, it becomes expensive. Yes. So about, uh, this was about 10, 11 years ago, um, it got to a point really, well, actually it was about 13 years ago that I made the decision. Um, and it got to the point really where I was being offered so much work, but you know, it was going to be much more equitable if I lived down there. So I, I took a decision. I wasn't doing much in England at the time. It was very quiet. Ironically, um, 10 years ago to almost to this month, I moved down. And um, basically, it was the same moment that um, uh, somebody turned around and did a remix. This guy called Mech. Yeah. Uh, actually, it was somebody else who really did the remix, but we won't go into that. Now it's too long a story, but they did a remix of uh, Thunder in My Heart. Yeah. And just as I arrived down here, it was already going into the charts and it went to number one. So, you know, the moment you leave, something happens. And I'm thinking, nothing's happening. I can take this moment, you know. <laughs> yeah. it kind of Things come and surprise you. And by the way, that Mech remix was one of my favourite songs to play on the radio oh, because it's basically a great song. All those remixes are born out of really good songs, aren't they? They didn't do, I mean, it was very clever. It was a guy called Lee Dagger, really, from Bimbo Jones, who did the real mix. Um, and they just contacted him to do it. He was the only guy who could figure a way to filter out a lot of the um, the backing of it, you know, the original drums and things like that, uh, and replace it with some new beats. Uh, and they did a damn good job. But, I mean, basically, it was the vocal from 1977, the recording from 1977. Um, Gene Page used to do all Marvin Gaye's records. He did the strings. That was all there, you know, so... Basically, it was a strange one, but um, that's what happens with remixes. Sometimes, you know, um, tracks that are, are very, very old. Um, look at Nina Simone and people like that getting remixed, you mm -hmm. know, and, and you get those, those wonderful old performances um, in those carefree days that we used to record in uh, brought right up to date. So it was great. I mean, I love what they did with it. It was fantastic. And it's still being played. It's up there with sort of a little less conversation, Elvis and songs like that, as you say, the Nina yeah, remix. Exactly. Let's talk about you. So there you are, Leo Sayer, just doing your own thing. And then 43 years ago, it all kicked off. And when we look at your international success, it is remarkable. You've had a staggering life and a remarkable career. You do know that, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I do, actually. I mean, it's been very interesting. Sometimes I'm underestimated, I guess, um, you know, and it's kind of interesting. I, I, I suppose I don't really push for that much publicity like a lot of my contemporaries. So I'm not sort of banging on the door all the time to please love me, you know, please like my songs. Um, I, I just tend to get on with songwriting really, and most of the time, and that's that's where I'm at these days. But um, I guess you know, you just absorb the past, and that's it. I, I really feel mentally like I'm 25 years old, and I'm. I'm still sort of a, a player and I, I've still got to prove things. That's my mentality and that's not stood me badly really because, 
it means I'm still hungry for things and, and uh, still wanting to prove points. Absolutely. Uh, you know, again, people moan about the internet and artists say that it's killed the music industry. But when you look at the hits that you've got, as I said earlier, more than I can say has got 8 million hits. Uh, you Make Me Feel Like yeah. Dancing has got just under 8 million hits. 6.9 million hits for When I Need You. I mean, you're still reaching a massive audience. I'm, I don't moan about the internet too much. I think it was a natural thing. I think it's wonderful. I think you've got to you've got to put the good things against everything. I mean, look, we can wake up every morning and with a question on our mind and we can find out from the internet the answer to that question very simply. Yeah. Um, everything's there. You know, the best thing about the internet is that the truth cannot be prevent- prevented from coming out, you know. Mm. So that's, so we do, you know, with someone like me, I guess, you know, people can actually look me up and find out everything that I've done and, and, and then put it all together. So, so you're, you're there to be counted. I think that... Um, it's interesting the way that YouTube has become the, 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 the most popular carrier of music now. It's kind of sad that we don't get paid and, you know, and all the musicians kind of making uh, a big beef about, you know, the new Apple music service, not mentioning musicians, producers and everything like that on record is, I think, quite justified because a lot of work goes into making records, as everybody knows. I mean, the sad thing now is that we spend... Like, I mean, on my latest album, Restless Years, I guess I spent about 65,000 uh, Australian dollars making that record. And it'll be lucky if it ever makes $10,000, you know, mm. however many you sell. So that's, that's how life is. But we've all come used to that now. We, it's not going to stop us putting the work into the craft. It's just the way things have gone. Um, but like you say, uh, in historical terms, the facts and figures are there and they can't be denied. And... You know, I'm, I'm just happy that my music seems to be popular, not only in, in English-speaking countries, but all over the world. Um, seems to be even more popular than ever. I mean, I'm amazed that at my age, at 67, I'm still as busy and in demand as ever. I think, though, it's a testament to your material. And then we look at who was the man who gave you your big break. I'm wondering whether Adam Faith was a seminal moment for you, or was it something before then when you sort of made it? it was David Courtney, really. Yeah. Um, I mean, David David was the guy that I turned up with my band in Brighton called Patches um, a, a to an audition with, and it was David who then said, come on, let's go and write some songs, because I don't think he was that interested in managing me, even though that's what the audition was supposed to do. It was supposed to have, could have bring him a band to manage, but I think he and I just hit it off so much, we decided to become a couple of songwriters. So... It was with that intention we then kind of um, met Adam. Uh, David already knew Adam. I mean, Adam had bought um, cars from David's father. David was a car dealer. And David played the drums a bit. So, you know, he could have uh, done some gigs uh, playing with, with, uh, with Adam's band. Uh, and, and so, you know, a connection was there already. But when Adam came in, I don't think... I think he was, I was thinking he was just going to be humouring David with listening to stuff and giving him some advice, but he actually turned around and said, right, I'm going to be the manager. So um, I don't think we predicted, we could have predicted that. So, mm. And that's how it all started off. What do you think it was that made you connect with your audience so well? Was it the fact you're a nice bit of trouser, Leo? <laughs> <laughs> it could have been in those days. I, I guess I, was, I had something glamorous you know, going for me. But I, but I, think, that, I think that it was basically a time when, um, you know, the, Songwriters uh, could could touch the hearts of people. Um, you know, you had Paul Simon and, and and Bob Dylan and Leonard Cohen and people like that before me. Um, I think that you know when I came out, there were there were people like um, I don't know Gary Brooker and you know um, uh, there, there was there were some wonderful artists around in England at the time. David Bowie, of course, and Mark Bolan. Um, you know, and and people kind of related to those artists in a very personal way. It wasn't a mob thing that got me popular, rather like the kind of mob thing that you see from my other contemporaries, the Bay City Rollers and people like that, or Slade. It was actually a much more kind of personal thing, and the relationship was that you'd sing songs that would touch the hearts of people because they kind of recognised that they were living similar lives, and you know, I was singing about living my life in a very autobiographical kind of way. And I think that that kind of touched people. So they said, you know, and this is where it's like Paul Simon and Bob Dylan before them. They say, yeah, that's me. 
he's singing about me, that could be my life. So that was the one-on-one kind of um, basis that um, artists like myself kind of broke through. Um, Adam and Dave did something with my, my music that I hadn't originally intended to do. I think I was a more sort of serious um, writer and serious artist, but they kind of gave it a pop flair. And the pop flair, of course, you know, led it into the charts because you know suddenly these songs were very catchy and not only the message um, of them came over, but basically the, the, the instant kind of um, uh, groove and sort of um, cheerful kind of nature of the, of the songs, things like One Man Band and The Show Must Go On, got there because they were cute and different. Hmm. Leo Sayer joins us on the phone today. He's back on tour from September. He'll be in Birmingham and Manchester and Worthing and Norwich and Buxton and all over Harlow, Milton Keynes, Durham. Uh, going into October as well, the brand new album is uh, coming very soon called Restless Years. We're going to talk about that shortly. I'm also interested by your American success because, I mean, it was remarkable how big you were in the States. And again, even today, it's everybody's dream to crack America, isn't it? I, I, I hit it at an interesting time. I mean, my great mate Rod Stewart was doing the same thing as me at the same time, and, and, and we were both kind of having a field day. I think right just before the two of us, Elton John had cracked it, and it, I think the, the whole market was rife for that kind of music that we were making. Um, it, it was it was very thoughtful music, uh, but it was very kind of I don't know. It was it had this British slant that we put on things. Um, the, the very down-to-earth kind of nature kind of seemed to work with the American market. So mm. it, was, it, it was good. It was it was fantastic. And you'd sing kind of songs about your little town and you'd find that they, they actually understood what you were doing. So that was very interesting. I guess if you look at it, the ricochet coming the other way was people like Bruce Springsteen, you know, singing about New Jersey and bringing that over um, to, to, to Europe and the UK and Randy Newman, of course, you know, bringing this kind of American landscape to us. Um, so it, it was interesting. I think it was the curiosity of people that, that where the music worked in America. And songs like Long Tall Glasses, you know, which was my first U.S. hit uh, in 1974, kind of reaching, or was it 75, reaching, um, you know, somewhere like the top 10, uh, it was an extraordinary breakthrough. But it kind of said something about the Americans' curiosity for English music. Did you choose your style of singing or is it just something you're born with that you have to go with? What I mean is you've got a falsetto end of your voice and then you've got quite a lot of bass as well. It's a unique sound you've got and you seem to be able to play with your voice to do different types of songs in different types of styles. Uh, yeah, I, I think if you listen to the voice on the early records like um, The Show Must Go On and, and then kind of go all the way to So You Make Me Feel Like Dancing or When I Need You, you'll see how it develops and then now um, I think it's richer, you know, that's just mm. naturally how it comes out. But I never really think about how I'm going to sing, it just comes out. To me, the words are very important, the emotion is important, what you're saying and what you're imparting. And um, I've got a big voice, so I can play with it and I can do different things. I mean, I haven't ever really stopped to analyse it, but I'm just lucky to be one of those guys who's got a really recognisable voice, even when I'm talking, people... Uh, sometimes hear me talking in a cafe or something like that and come over and, and, and they'll look around the corner and they go, that's Leo Sayer, yeah, I thought I recognised him. And it's amazing how, I think if Paul McCartney spoke or maybe Ray Davis of the Kinks spoke, you'd, you'd know it was them by the mm. tone of their voice. Even a talking voice is like a singing voice. So I think I've just got this very recognisable voice. I'm very lucky that it's very strong and it always has been strong, so I can do a lot of things with it. These days, I don't really use an engineer when I'm doing the voice. I, I just record myself, and I think that that kind of um, brings you closer to the performance. Um, I, I've kind of learnt a few tricks of the trade with my studio of how to do things, and um, I, I like to be in the room by myself, and I like to not have anybody between me and the tape, as it were. Mm. It's not tape these days, of course, it's digital, but, you know, not have... Uh, uh, take, take, almost undo the recording process. So I've found that I can... I've found a way to kind of make the recordings very honest and very straightforward and they usually only take maybe a couple of takes because you're, you're tuned into it you know and focused and and, and so I'm, I'm very happy with the way that the, the vocals go these days 
Leo, I'm a deeply unattractive man. We've known each other a while now. We can be honest. You, on the other hand, have had the ladies following you since very early on in your career. What's it like being sexy? I think it could be more more charm than handsome looks. I'm a good little charmer. I've I've always known how to how to um, how to charm people and and get my way, as it were. I think that that entertainers are like that. You know, I mean, you might look at Madonna in one moment and actually think. Well, you know, she's very sexy. But the next moment you look at her, you go, she's not that good looking, is she? Mm. <laughs> you know, we all do that. But because she's got this chutzpah and this push and this drive, she gets her way, doesn't she? And she gets yeah. her men. And that's how, that's how music often is. I mean, there's, a, there's this great kind of almost myth that something is actually sexier than it really is. But I think it's part of the... Part of the uh, sort of compulsive kind of message coming over, um, and I and I do think it's still a romantic profession because there's loads of people who'd love to be able to sing, mm. and I still get girls coming up to me and kind of impressed at, wow, it's you, you know, and I don't, mm. I, I'm, I'm, I kind of pinch myself and go, no, nah, this isn't really happening. They're just falling in love with the voice, the image. Mm. So you know, um, but it's it, it's a it's a medium that's communicative. So. Yeah. Basically, it's always going to be, you're always going to be crossing those barriers, you know. How hedonistic was it at its peak? Oh, God, yes, absolutely. Um, it always was, you know. I mean, you know, we were rock bands, especially traveling in America and Australia and places like that. There were plenty of wild women around and there were plenty of wild parties and mm. there were plenty of opportunities that you didn't want to kind of pass up. So, which is all good because it just gives you more... It, it makes the job more enjoyable, enjoyable, and 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 it gives you more confidence. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Nobody nobody got hurt, as far as I'm concerned. It all was good, clean fun. Well, and that's what's interesting. I've never known you get involved in shenanigans. You never seem to be falling out of clubs. Did you? You'd never know. You'd right. Never know, Alex. <laughs> no, but that's clever because some people attract that and want it, and then destroy their own career by doing it. You seem to have kept yourself out of the press. I think that you know you have to look at the psyche of what makes entertainers and performers um, and what makes celebrities really, a lot of it is a cry for attention and a lot of mixed up people kind of end up in this game. But you know, the nice thing is that if the game of fame and celebrity and success um, kind of works in your favour, in other words, kind of if you're honest within it then it often can straighten out the weird peccadilloes that, um, you know, people who want to be taken notice of bring with them, you know. So, I mean, look, we're all a bit crazy exhibitionists when we, when we are, are hungry for fame. Look at, look at those, you know, what I think awful shows like, um, you know, um, uh, I can't even mention their names because they're so bloody awful, but all these competition shows that we've got on now, The X Factor, etc., um, you know, and you look at the gleam in people's eyes, the need to be loved, the need to be wanted. And I think that to a certain extent, there are people who do anything for fame. Mm. But that kind of usually gets ironed out after a while. And, you know, of course, there are fun and madness and shenanigans, but basically levels out, you know, that basically you have a responsibility once you've got there to do the job and to do it well. So that usually takes over. I don't know, but it's... Um, you see some victims, you know, you think Kurt Cobain and Amy Winehouse, yeah, and you think to people like that, that were never, ever going to survive in a game like this. Even Michael Jackson, you know, that the temptations and the sidetracking of it all would, would eventually kind of, you know, sadly uh, become bigger than the music. Yeah. Jim Morrison at the Doors, you know, people like that. People actually kind of almost killed by their eagerness and their need to be loved and their need to do anything to get there and, and sustain it, you know, drugs and all of that sort of stuff. And I'm glad I was one of the artists that got straightened out by the business rather than kind of got twisted by it. What is it, family behind you to tell you no and keep your feet on the ground? No, not really. I think it's yourself. I think it's, um, you know, without well, sounds really old-fashioned to say it, but a kind of moral compass. Right. At the end of the day, you want to do the job really good. You want to do it well because you you have experiences. Like I mean, we we're talking about you know the, getting to America that first time. You know what a wonderful opportunity. You don't want to blow it. You don't want right. to kind of like end up in a prison and being banned from coming the next time, do you? No. Um, some people kind of push it to the end of the earth, and 
they push it to the edge and somehow they survive. Maybe they, because they, you know, they're they're good enough. I mean, people like Johnny Rotten have survived it all because basically he's a very talented man. And at the end of the day, however rough, shod, and you know, anti everything he is, yeah. he's a very talented bloke, and that's you know, it's the music that survives. And again, we look at your era. The 70s has been much maligned recently. I know you've been down under and completely out of it. Are you disappointed by uh, the stuff that's gone on in the 70s, the Savills of the world? Were you surprised by it, or did you know one day this was all going to come out? Uh, look, we all knew what was going on. It's just a different time. People got away with things. You know, um, you look at the 60s and the craze and how long that they got away with being gangsters. It's the same mm. thing. I don't think that the, the the moral end of you know paedophilia or or or, or the, the the sort of taking advantage of, of, of sexual positions is anything different than the mafia, really. You know, it's just people will always be like that. I'm sorry, but it's just as bad now for me with politicians. They're taking advantage of the whole bloody world. We are not free of those kind of. You know, those I don't think we can blame it on any age. In any age, there's going to be problems. And right now, at the moment, you know, the biggest problem is people fucking up the planet and, yeah. um, and, and, and ignoring climate, but also kind of, uh, you know, not really listening to people and, and, and dictating to people is a terrible problem that we've got because basically most of, you know, from all the way from politics to banks to uh, the climate to freedom of choice to free speech to... People wanted to spy on us, uh, the internet, it's through via the internet or whatever. Um, we, we, we are under threat, you know, and I think that, that you can sidetrack it all by blaming certain ages, but I think that, you know, there's a, there's a big job to be done out there for right-thinking people. But I think that we've got also responsibility to the people around us. You know, once you get into a situation, things kind of change where um, you suddenly have the responsibility of people who believe in your message. So... I do believe these days as a songwriter and as a singer, I, I really should be doing something worthy and worthwhile with my profession and my abilities. Hmm. So consequently, you know, there's songs like One Green World, uh, there's a song about Julian Assange on there called The Wrong Man, you know, in the new album. And um, Beautiful Year is about kind of the opening track is about a guy who, who was very active kind of in the 60s or 70s and goes to sleep and... Uh, he's a bit of a rebel, you know, then he wanted to change the world. He goes to sleep and he wakes up in this age and how's he going to deal with it, you know? Um, and I think that those are, those are songs of conscience, which um, I can't ever stop coming out of me these days because I do feel a responsibility that we do have to make a better world. We, we have to follow in the footsteps of John Lennon and Bob Marley and all those people who kind of really uh, thought that the music could change the world. So we have to carry on with that mission, all of those from that time. You do seem a man of great moral compass and a man who knows his mind and speaks his mind. We saw you in 2007 on Big Brother. And again, some people like it and some people don't. But at least we know where you stand. It seems these days people don't like people to have an opinion. I'm just an absolutely awful show. I, I just, um, I, I, I was persuaded that if I went on that show, I might get a record deal. And it was my stupid thing. I think the moment I walked in, I thought, what the hell have I done? So it was mm. just something so wrong for me. It was just, you know, um, I don't know. It was just a stupid decision, which I'd take the blame for. In terms of the theatrics of the show, though, I mean, it's one of the greatest moments in history. It was brilliant. I mean, and, and that's what they want, don't they? They want conflict yeah, and they the want anger. Time, the same time, they didn't cover all the great stuff that I did in there, all the good stuff I did in there. Well, not great, but I mean, you know, I was very clever. I did the most amazing um, four days of mine. I refused to sleep, <laughs> but they, they never televised any of that. You can't control the edit, can you, Leah? No, you can't control the edit because they want to do what they want to do. Yeah. But, I mean, it was interesting out of the whole thing, but um, the guy who did the, the, the after show, and I used to see him because I had to hang on uh, because of the contract, whereas I would have not got paid any money, or my charity mm. wouldn't have got any paid any money. Um, so I, I hung on, and it was Russell Downed, and I, I kind of got friendly with him from doing all those shows at the end of it. I thought, he's a very clever man. Yeah. You know? What do you think about his latest approach to politics? Because, again, his PR standing has gone down from probably 10 to 3 because he's having opinions. Opinions make you popular with some, but unpopular with others, doesn't it? Um, yeah, I think he's, he's probably tripped. 
um, as they say, hoist, he got hoisted by his own petard, yes. um, which is a shame. Yeah. Um, I think he's, um, I think he's a very clever guy, and I think his message is right on. But I think he tends to, maybe he's got a bunch of people around him who are just kind of like saying, yes, 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 you can get away with anything. And um, I think he needs to think sometimes before he opens his mouth. But that's that's fine. You do need some people to upset the apple cart. That at least makes people think. Unfortunately. These days, anybody who talks against the system, as yeah. it were, um, has to kind of put up with an enormous amount of internet and media propaganda, which mm. is the way of the world. I mean, after I did Big Brother, and of course I swore and I was, you know, grumpy sort of sort on there, um, the amount of propaganda I got be- against me, um, particularly in England, was extraordinary. So this is the problem with the public domain and, you know, mm. public. But, you know, but but hey, at the same time, I mean, I I, I think it's wonderful that we're able to, um, you know, say what we think. Uh, we have to, or else everything's going to break down. <laughs> yeah. It's so disposable, though. That's the thing with all that reality stuff. It comes and it goes. It's today's front pages. Tomorrow, everybody gets back on with their lives, unlike your music, which seems to live on forever. Is it still thrilling when you hear it on the radio? It's, it's strange. I, I don't really. I'm too busy making it. I think the thrills that I get is just after recording something and listening to it back and actually thinking, boy, that works. And, um, and, and often, you know, you're tilting at windmills. And, and these days I, I try to kind of experiment a little bit and twist the envelope just because I can, because there's nobody standing over me telling me how to make my records. I'm, I'm, I'm in almost my own record company now. And, you know, and uh, I've got my wonderful partner, Donatella, who's my manager. And, and, and she basically just says, yeah, just do what you feel like. And, and, if it's crap, she'll soon tell me, and it will never see the light of day. But at the same time, I'm I'm free to make those decisions and and to and to experiment. I mean, there's a song on there called the Radio Song, and I've got loads of friends who are DJs and wonderful DJs. You know, like uh, people who've been around the music, like those kind of John Peel type of characters yeah. who live life by the songs. They actually kind of well, look at people like Tony Blackburn. You know, they just they think in the terms of the songs that they play and yeah. that's their moral compass totally is they, they were they were brought up with all of this stuff that's all they've ever listened to and that's and that's their kind of philosophies are all tied into it so i thought i'd write a song about one of those guys and i decided the only way to write it was to actually write it um as 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 a series of song titles telling a story which they can do yeah. so it was a challenge but i think i pulled it off it's the radio song on there yeah, it's very, very nice. I mean, there are so many lovely hits on this brand new album. It's called Restless Years. Uh, I, I love the uh, competing with the DJ as well. I mean, that's a similar sort of feel, isn't it? Great vocals on it. Yeah, and, and, and um, yeah, I was trying to sort of like fill in my soul side, as it were. Um, and it's a, it's a conundrum that, um, you know, like in anything in, in, in life, I mean, um, not just in music, but you think of real craftsmen who've been um, usurped by um, instant solutions. I mean, a guy can paint a house and he's an incredibly skilled painter and the way he uses a roller. And meanwhile, somebody comes in the next day in the house next door and just puts up some tape and sprays the bloody place. Mm-hmm. And it just looks as good a finish, but it's not the same thing, is it? No, <laughs> no it isn't. And so I think I'm kind of talking about um, certain kind of the dying of a craft you know yeah. so there's somebody just like in go back to the radio song i mean that guy he, he in the song he said it sort of says you know um the boss at the station says you've served your time now a button on the desk can get me strawberry wine you see the skills of the dj the radio dj are not really required anymore because no. there's an automatic playlist and there's an automated system for playing the music and yeah. you know a based on, on some theory from some guy a million miles away who really uh, just given a template that the radio station buy because it doesn't it costs them less money than employing someone who actually knows what they're doing yeah. and the same thing a band goes to a gig you know in competing to, with a DJ and the guy's got his girlfriend and his girlfriend is more impressed by the guy who never breaks sweat and pulls records out of a bag and just kind of spins them than the guys who are actually creating music with their bare hands yep. and their voices. So I think it's a dying of craft that um, was, I was, was troubling me when I wrote that. But um, it, you win in the end because the last line says, 
human life can't be replaced by USBs, yeah. which is quite true. Yeah, it is. It makes me laugh that in Las Vegas at the moment, the biggest stars are DJs who for two hours work playing other people's records get £300,000. Well, Kenya yeah. West at um, <laughs> Glastonbury, I rest my case. I mean, Wasn't it dreadful? He didn't have Queen to play. What kind of show would he have? Yeah. Sometimes people ask me what I think about this. And I'm like, I, I can't really comment too much because it's a completely different industry see look the music industry is 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 two poles apart there are people who are in it for the money and there are people who are in it for the for the heart yeah and and you really can't you know it's like politicians i mean i always say never vote for anybody who's got more money than you yeah what's the fucking point yes it's a very good point i always say that about casinos look at the size of their home and look at the size of yours and see who's winning well, yeah from anybody who isn't the same as you or isn't in the same kind of you know doesn't have the same problems and everything yeah. to me actually seems kind of lethally wrong yeah. so I, I don't I've always been a rebel I suppose but I've, I've, I've always believed that um, everything that you do in life can be proven by the actual doing of it yeah. um, it's, it's quite simple really it's not complicated you, you do what you need to do to get through the day and to actually make your life better you could fill up the news with wonderful stories about um, how we could make the planet you know, better and make the world better and how there are some amazing positive people um, doing incredible things. Or you can fill up the news with fear stories. And, yeah. um, so if the news is filled with fear stories, it makes you think for a moment that there's nobody doing anything decent on this planet. And that's completely and utterly wrong. So yeah. I don't actually listen to the news and I don't believe the news. Yeah. Leo Sayer, it's great talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. I hope we get to meet when you come to England because you're one of my favourite people. Your music is so wonderful and you've brought such joy to people's lives. Well, thank you, Alex, as ever, for your undying support. And um, I, th I think that it's... Uh, I'm at a nice moment with England at the minute where I've been away for quite a time, but from what I can tell of the reaction towards the record and, um, and, and you know, and, and the reaction towards the tour... Um, I think that I'm going to be much more of a constant visitor soon. I hope so, because you're a great talent and we deserve to have you back. You're going on tour in September, starting Wednesday the 9th in Birmingham, Thursday 10th, Manchester, Friday 11th, Worthing, right through until Warrington, which is on Sunday the 11th of October. The brand new album is called Restless Years. It really is lovely and celebrates your voice so beautifully. Never sounded better. And that's out as well on the 28th of August. The tour, you can find out more details by going to www.leosayer.com. Leo, great to talk to you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. Thanks for all your good wishes.